Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. We're just giving things a couple minutes uh, before uh, we get started so we can allow a few more people to join. If you have friends that are joining today, please tell them to do so. If they're a few minutes late, that's totally fine. They'll still be able to join the workshop. Okay, it looks like we have everybody in from the waiting room. We might have a few more joining, so you might continue to hear those doorbells as we get started. Uh, but in any case, we only have an hour together today, so we'll get rolling. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today and for coming out to our off-campus housing workshop. Um, we have a lot of knowledge in our virtual room today, so we're glad that you're here. Soak in as much as possible. Hopefully you have a pen or you have your laptop there and can take some great notes. Um, and please don't worry, we will be sharing lots of contact information and different websites a few, at a few different points throughout the presentation. Um, so to get things started, we'll just do some quick introductions. So my name is Katie Fraser and I work for the International Department. I'm based out of the Aurelia campus in Southern Ontario. And uh, my role is really anything related to supporting international students or our students going abroad. Um, so of course, this time of year, housing is a big one that comes up, particularly for international students who have never rented off campus um, in Ontario or Canada more broadly. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, we always tackle this time of year and uh, we like to bring together some expertise to get you uh, all the info that you need to make some really important decisions. So I'll turn it over to Lee Castle to introduce herself. Hi good morning everyone my name is Lee Castle I'm the uh, full-time staff person for the student union in Aurelia. Um, my official title is the Aurelia campus coordinator basically what that means is I help um, students navigate all the services that the student union offers as uh, well as clubs. And um, I assist the vice president really, who's also here today um, in events and campaigns and things like that. Uh, I also oversee the health and dental plan for students at both campuses. Awesome, thanks Lee. Roddy Lynn, over to you. Yes, <clears throat> good morning. I am Roddy Lynn. I'm the current acting director at Lakehead University Community Legal Services. We are a legal clinic that is staffed by our second and third year law students at the Bore Alaskan Faculty of Law, which is in Thunder Bay. Um, we're not on main campus, we're just slightly off campus, but if you are in Thunder Bay and you do need some legal advice, I would encourage you to call our clinic. It's a free legal service for people who financially qualify. We cover a lot of areas, but specifically today, we will be talking about tenant rights. We represent tenants in any matters that they have with their landlords, um, provided it's something that is a legal issue and, and one that, we, that you qualify for. So with that, I will turn it over to Holly Dinsmore. I am Holly. I am a second year student at the Lakehead University Community Legal Services. So kind of like what Roddy Lynn was saying, I'm a caseworker there. Uh, we do a lot of really great work uh, for people who need legal assistance. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing some of the ins and outs of landlord tenants' rights. 
Awesome. Thanks, Holly and Amanda. Over to you. Hello, sorry. Um, seems to be bad timing. I just had a package delivered and my dogs are barking. <laughs> Very sorry about that. Um, but my name is Amanda. I'm a third year student um, at the Bora Alaskan Faculty of Law. Um, and I'm a caseworker. Um, and I also did my practice placement there last term. Awesome. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks again to everybody for being here today. I know it's a busy time of year, so I appreciate everyone taking the time out to uh, talk about this important topic. So before we jump into material, we just want to get a sense of who's in the room right now. So if you could open your chat box by using the more button on the bottom of your screen, click more and then chat, and you'll see a chat box uh, pop up there. And we're curious to know where are you looking for housing? Are you looking for housing in Aurelia? Thunder Bay or somewhere else? If you want to type your answer in the chat box right now, that would be great. It will help us and our presenters to really tailor our material a little bit more and know what communities you're looking at. Awesome. Lots of Thunder Bay people here today. Uh, someone looking for a place for placement. Great. And the second question we have for you, um, we want to know, is this the first time that you're looking for off-campus housing or have you lived off-campus before in the past? Okay. A little bit of variation there. Perfect. So keep the answers coming. If you haven't put your response in there yet, um, you can keep responding as we get started. So as you know, through the invitations you've received through email and newsletters and maybe through social media, we are covering a lot of different topics today. Um, a big chunk of our time is going to be spent on the legal aspects with respect to living off campus. And that's why our community legal services team is here today. We'll also talk a little bit about searching for housing and, and roommates and how to go about doing that and some of the tools available to you. We'll talk about money matters, including budgeting um, and how this might affect different housing situations. We'll talk about navigating roommate conflicts, which unfortunately is uh, something that usually comes up and can be a big source of tension and stress for you. So we want to avoid that as much as possible. And then lastly, we'll give you a timeline to help you plan ahead and be proactive with your housing search. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Holly um, and uh, she can get started with the screen share. Okay, um, so we'll be speaking about residential tenancies in Ontario. Next slide, sorry. Uh, we are an initiative of the Bora Alaskan Faculty of Law at Lakehead University in partnership with Legal Aid Ontario. We're operated by student caseworkers overseen by Review Council. Our mission is to serve low income and vulnerable clients, provide legal advice, representation and referrals, and to promote public legal education initiatives. Financial eligibility. So there's no cost um, associated with our legal advice and representation, uh, but you must meet Legal Aid Ontario financial eligibility guidelines to qualify for service. This is true for most legal clinics funded by Legal Aid Ontario. Our areas of practice include provincial offenses, minor criminal code offenses, small claims court, landlord and tenant board, employment law, simple wills and powers of attorney, as well as public legal education presentations. So landlord and tenant rights and responsibilities. The Residential Tenancies Act is a law in Ontario that governs most places that people live in and call home. There are important exceptions like mobile homes, hotels, social care facilities, university residences, or units where a bathroom or kitchen is shared with the landlord or the landlord's immediate family. Um, the Residential Tenancy Act deals with the rights and responsibilities for both landlords and tenants during a rental situation. So now we're going to speak a bit about standard form leases. Um, Ontario required a standard form of lease for most residential leases since April 2018. 
There is a new form beginning on March the 1st, 2021 for new lease agreements entered into or after that date. Uh, you can visit the website listed here on the slide. Um, and on that website, there is a guide for the standard lease and it's also available in many languages. Um, this lease is not used for university residences, public or subsidized housing, mobile homes and land leased homes, housing co-ops, sublease units, so, sorry, subleased units and care homes, housing um, in which the landlord or immediate family share a kitchen or a bathroom. The standard form can be personalized to have unique details about your tenancy. Um, for example, who has to pay for utilities, whether there is parking available, the length of the lease, the amount of rent, the move-in date, and any services provided by the landlord. Uh, you can add pages for any legal additional terms that you or your landlord agree to. You should always seek legal advice before agreeing to additional terms that you do not understand. So what happens if you didn't use a standard form of lease? Uh, you can request one from your landlord and you should make this request in writing and then keep a copy of that request. Uh, you, you can seek legal advice if your new tenancy after March the 1st, 2021 does not use the new standard form lease. Um, and if your landlord does not provide one in response to your written request. So before you move in, uh, your legal right to live in your place is referred to as tenancy. This legal right usually um, comes from an agreement between you and your landlord in the form of a tenancy agreement, a lease, or a rental agreement. This tenancy can be in writing or spoken and is the legal contract between you and your landlord. Whether your agreement is in writing or is spoken, it is important that you understand what you are agreeing to and to set out all important terms. However, anything in your tenancy agreement that conflicts with the Residential Tenancies Act is not valid. Um, so some examples of terms that conflict with the Residential Tenancy Act include a no pet clause, security, cleaning, or key deposits. Last month's rent deposits are legal waiving the landlord's maintenance obligations or waiving rent increase guidelines. So rent and rent increases. There is no limit to, on how much rent landlords can charge new tenants when they first move in. Uh, your starting rents will be whatever you and your landlord agree on. After you agree on a starting rent, there are limits on how much and how often your rent can go up. So your rent can only be increased once in a 12 month period um, and that increase is capped. So as an example, for 2020, the rent increase guideline was 2.2%. Uh, so if your rent was $1,000 a month, your landlord could have only increased your rent $22 um, once in that 12 month period at the end of the 12 months. Your landlord is responsible provi for providing you with receipts for the rent that you have paid, and uh, you should make sure that you ask for those receipts as proof that you've paid the rent. So what can your landlord charge you? In addition to illegal rent increases, according to the Residential Tenancies Act, your landlord is not permitted to charge you for certain things. For example, your landlord is not allowed to charge you any security deposit other than a rent deposit equal to one month's rent that can only be used for last month's rent. Your landlord is not allowed to charge you for maintenance cost or normal wear and tear unless it is damage that you or a guest have negligently or intentionally caused. And your landlord is not allowed to require you to provide Uh, so, sorry, <laughs> your landlord is not allowed to require you to provide them with post dated checks. Your landlord is responsible for keeping the rental unit in a good state of repair, keeping the rental unit fit for habitation, and normal wear and tear on the rental unit. Your landlord is also responsible for complying with all health, safety, and housing and maintenance standards, such as ensuring the rental unit is complete with adequate smoke detectors. Uh, paying for pest control if the, the rental is infested with bed bugs, cockroaches, mice, rats, or any other vermin, and safeguarding the rental unit with appropriate railings. 
your landlord's obligations. So your landlord must provide you with valid notice under the Residential Tenancies Act before entering your unit. Valid notice is outlined in the Residential Tenancies Act as if the tenant consents at the time the landlord enters, if the landlord provides 24 hours notice in writing with the reasons for their entry and a time to expect entry, and the entry needs to be a specified time block between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Um, it's important to note that if there is an emergency, the landlord may enter the unit without 24 hours written notice. So valid reasons for entry under the Residential Tenancies Act. Uh, your landlord can enter to complete repairs, uh, to allow insurers or mortgagers to inspect the unit, uh, to carry out inspection of the unit if it is determined uh, that the unit is in good repair and fit for habitation to ensure that the unit complies with health and property standards, it is otherwise reasonable to carry out, carry out an inspection for any reasonable reason specified in your rental agreement. Um, I do notice that we are seeing some questions here in the chat, but we can get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'm now gonna hand it over to Holly and she's gonna speak to you um, about what you can do if you think that your landlord has not met his or her obligations. Yeah, so what if your landlord hasn't, or you don't think your landlord's met his or her obligations? So the first thing you should do is make sure that your landlord is aware of any outstanding repairs or maintenance concerns, because they can't fix something if they don't know about it. It's important to, all right, and once they are aware of it, it does become their obligation to address this issue in a timely fashion. It's also important to note that you should voice these concerns in writing and always keep a copy of the written complaint for your records. If you, so if something were to happen, you cannot withhold rent for any outstanding maintenance issues or other RTA breaches. Instead, you should go to the landlord and tenant board and they can award you damages or abatement, which is a discount of rent if you file an application for the landlord's breach. Sorry, my dog is now growling. <laughs> If you do withhold rent though, the landlord can then go and apply to the landlord tenant board and have you evicted. So make sure you are continuing to pay rent. So as your obligation as a tenant, you are responsible for normal cleanliness of your rental unit, paying your rent in a timely fashion, any deliberate or negligent damage caused by yourself or by your guests, if you're interfering with any of the other's tenants' re reasonable enjoyment of their rental units and not interfering with any of the landlord's lawful rights or obligations. So just as much as the RTA gives you, the tenant, certain rights, it also gives the landlord several rights as well. And this is uh, seen in the way of eviction notices. And there are two types of eviction notices. There's eviction for cause, which is kind of what we talked about earlier, like non-payment of rent, interfering with others or causing serious problems, damage or overcrowding of the unit, illegal acts or misrepresentation of income. The second type of notice is eviction without cause, which is if your unit has been condemned, demolished or converted if your landlord or new purchaser wants the unit for personal use, or if there's a mutual agreement between you and your landlord. So what do you do if you are served a notice of eviction from your landlord? Well, don't panic. The first thing you should do is read the form in full. It will usually tell you what your options are as a tenant. You should note that if you are served a notice of eviction, you do not have to leave by the date indicated on that notice. In order for a notice of eviction from your landlord to be enforceable, they have to apply or have to file an application with the landlord and tenant board and then attend a hearing. And until you've been served an order from the landlord and tenant board evicting you, you do not have to leave your unit. 
Either way, if you do get a notice of eviction, you should seek legal assistance immediately. Another thing that you should be aware about is uh, that it's against the law for landlords to discriminate against you because of your race, sex, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, marital status, color, nationality, religion, or the country you were born. They also can't discriminate against any of your disabilities, if you're receiving social assistance, or if you have a child living with you. So what do you do before you move out? Well, when you sign a lease, you are held responsible for the remainder of the lease if you leave before the period of time specified, unless the landlord allows you to move out early. If you are renting the rental unit based on a month to month tenancy, you are required to give your landlord at least 60 days notice before you move out. There are some exceptions to this 60 days notice rule, which are if you or a child living with you has experienced violence, then 28 days notice is sufficient together with the certain required documentation as is set out in the RTA, or if your lease specifies a certain move out date. So what happens when your lease comes to an end? Well, some landlords may tell you that when your monthly lease ends, you only have two choices, which is to move out or to renew your lease. But the law says you do have a third choice. You can simply just continue your tenancy on a month to month basis. You don't have to sign a new contract and you don't need to move out if you don't want to. You just continue staying there. So this would be if you have a 12 month lease and you wanna stay there, you can just stay, you don't have to sign anything else and it will just become a month to month tenancy after that. And speaking of students, if you do have a 12 month tenancy, you might be interested in going home or if you have a job somewhere else for the summer, there's an option that's called a sublease or a sublet agreement. Uh, so you can get a sublease or a sublet agreement by getting consent from your landlord. A landlord cannot arbitrarily or unreasonably withhold consent to this. And if your landlord does not consent or does not reply to your request, then you may be able to terminate your tenancy agreement, but always seek legal advice before doing that. Something to consider that if you do have a sub tenant in your unit, you are still obligated to the landlord themselves. So any damages that happen to the unit, you still owe the, the landlord that, but the subtenant is owes you back under the RTA as well. So they're obligated uh, to under you. And if you don't have a sublease for the unit, the landlord cannot rent your rental unit while you're away if you are still paying rent. So they're still held to the standards of the RTA if you're not there. If you feel like your rights have been violated, you should see the landlord and tenant board website for applications that can be filled out on the website that's on the slide here. If you have any issues regarding mold, pests, or vermin infestations or other health and safety concerns, you should contact your local health unit and they can assist you there. And get legal advice. I know as students, it seems like it might not be in your budget, but as we discussed, there are options for you. In Aurelia, there is a community legal clinic. And in Thunder Bay, there's us, the Lakehead University Community Legal Services, both of which the contact information is on the slide there. So we, you can call us, we'll have an intake appointment, and we can help you with anything or any issues that you have uh, coming up. And... Yeah, is there any questions from anyone? No further questions in the chat box just yet. Um, I've been watching that. The only question that came up was around the land lease. But uh, Roddy Lynn answered that one. Um, and the only other question I had so far was uh, confirming if the session was being recorded and where the link was going to be available afterwards. Um, so please know that once uh, we're finished these sessions, we will be posting the link online um, and I will email all those who registered for any of the off-campus housing workshops to provide you with the direct link so that you'll, you'll be able to watch and um, 
do a refresh if you need to watch the, uh, watch the video content again. Okay, so I am gonna turn it over to uh, Lee Castle and we're gonna talk a little bit about the nitty gritties of searching for housing and for roommates. Thanks, Katie. Um, so one of the first things that you're gonna to wanna to consider um, when you're looking for housing is the location. Um, basically, where do you want to live? There's a question there, Katie. Can questions be asked verbally or just via chat? Oh, you're, you're welcome to use the microphone if you prefer that. Uh, that's fine too. Did you have a question right now, Don? Uh, I did. It was both a, a question and a comment. Um, just. I had, I had many many questions came up as the, the legal side was being presented, uh, just because I live in an area where I own my home, but it is a condominium um, uh, of townhouses. Uh, so the rules are slightly different. So some of the things that are rules legally, you also have to keep in mind that a condominium may have their own rules, that, like about how many people can live in a particular unit. Um, and sometimes students don't understand that. Um, the lease is a tough issue because at least prior to COVID, a lot of landlords wanted the guarantee of having a student or having renters, you know, by at the end of April when students move out. How should, how should that relationship be worked out? Um, because if legally the tenants can just stay there, even if their lease is up, but the landlord wants a guarantee of income for the year, how how does how do you work that out? Yeah, so I mean, there's many factors to consider. Obviously, a contract is a contract. So if there if somebody's already signed a lease agreement and, and now there's a potential for wanting a variation of those terms, we would recommend that that student contact the clinic and we would give uh, be, be able to give legal advice if they financially qualify. We'd have to see the agreement and see what all the terms look like. Um, if it's something going forward and a new lease agreement is going to be entered into and we're still in this uncertain COVID world, um, again, we would recommend before signing any lease agreement that the student contact the clinic and see if we can help and we would be able to advise them on, you know, sort of best efforts based on what those terms look like. But really, it comes down to, to a contract. Anything you sign, you're going to be bound to unless both parties agree otherwise. Okay, so it's important then for both sides to be very clear, because it'd be very unfair to the landlord if the tenant was now staying month by month and then suddenly announced in September that they were moving. And, and, and then that puts the landlord at a disadvantage to being able to find a renter for the school year, especially, you know, in an area where you are specifically renting to mostly to students. Is yeah, so... Um, if landlords are looking for advice, there is a website called the Landlord Self-Help, and, and that's where we would recommend that landlords go if they want to find advice on these types of situations. Of course, we only give advice to, to tenants, and we will obviously recommend what's in the best interest of a tenant. Yeah, and I'm looking at this from, from both sides because I have you know, people asking me from, from both sides of it. Um, the other question that I had had to do with leases um, but in, I, I have, I, under, I understood that if you have a, if you've signed a lease for a year that you have to honor that, but I was told that, um, no, even with the lease, uh, a tenant could give, what is it? One or two months notice and could move. Do you have to have cause for that? I think it depends on, uh, are you asking at the end of the term? Or are you saying they want to leave three months in? Which, what's your question? Yeah, no, if they want to leave within the terms of the lease. So let's say three months in, they're really unhappy there. Can, right. can they just give notice and leave? Yeah, so, so no, that, that was covered a, a bit earlier. I think Holly went through that. When you sign on to a fixed term, the tenant is liable for that fixed term. If, in fact, the tenant wants to leave earlier, it is um, something that they would have to get the landlord's consent to do. Um, but sometimes tenants can't do that, right? Like there's been an emergency, they need to leave the country, they need to go um, and they leave. Um, they can still be liable for the remainder of that term, but landlord then has obligations. A landlord has an obligation to still try to, um, to in fact, mitigate their damages, 
get another tenant in there and try to secure rent from another tenant for that time. So the landlord, it's it's not an automatic win for a landlord. If someone breaks that fixed term lease, they don't just get to sit back and say a tenant still has to pay me for the remainder of that term. They still have to take steps to mitigate their damages and find another tenant to pay and show what those steps were before they'd be able to, in my opinion, be successful in any type of an action against a, a tenant for the remainder of that term. But a fixed lease is a fixed lease. Um, it, the tenant does not have a right to leave ahead of time unless the terms within that written lease say otherwise or unless the landlord agrees. And After the terms of the lease, tenant can stay. Tenant does not have to leave at that end date. Tenant can stay and it can automatically turn into a month to month without the landlord's consent. So this has come up a few times uh, from the tenant's point of view where they've had to leave or, the, or they can't afford to pay so that they need to leave and break the lease but they've been told that they have to find somebody to replace them uh, under that or, or to sublet to under that lease. So again, we would have to look at the terms of the lease, right? Every, I mean, that could be built into someone's written lease, depending on what that says. Generally speaking, there's no provision under the Residential Tenancies Act that says if a tenant is leaving early, that it's the tenant's responsibility. Um, but again, knowing that the law would be if the tenant breaks a fixed term lease that they could definitely be liable for the remainder of that fixed term lease. Um, th that may be something that a tenant wants to do, try to find somebody so that they know, okay, I found somebody else. So now I know I'm not going to be responsible for the remaining five months because there's somebody else to, to be able to pay. It's not, it's not a legal requirement under the act, whether or not it's been built into the lease agreement, we'd have to read the lease and see. Okay, so I really appreciate this. There's a lot of students who are in that and international students who are in that situation. And, and yes, I get, you know, it says to read through the document very clearly, but there's a lot of um, language barriers to, sure. to understanding it. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, th the best advice I think, or best even legal information to give anybody right now is to require that any leases are the standard form of lease. And remember that they can go to the website and they can find that standard form of lease in many different languages. So they need to understand what they're signing. Um, so hopefully those, um, those new revisions that the government has undertaken for March 1st with all the various languages uh, will be helpful. Oh, yes, I saw that, but I didn't quite put the pieces together of, yeah. of how useful that is. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. no problem. Great. Thanks, Roddy Lynn. Okay, back to you, Lee. Perfect. Great conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that you want to consider about when you're thinking about where you want to live is think about the amenities that are in the area. Um, so those are things like employment opportunities and placement opportunities grocery stores, your access to the bus stop and bus routes. Um, also, you may want to consider fitness and recreation facilities if that's your thing. I know in Thunder Bay, there are um, recreation facilities on campus, um, but in Aurelia, unfortunately, that's not so. Um, and you might also want to consider restaurants and entertainment. There are some student-friendly neighborhoods in Aurelia that are easily accessible to the university and lots of other amenities on the two Westridge routes. So if you um, take a look at the image that's there, you'll see there's the blue Westridge via Coldwater route and the red Westridge via Oldberry Road. And at the bottom of those two routes um, is Lakehead University. Um, so just above Lakehead, there's a quite a big neighborhood there that um, is just off University Avenue that's very popular amongst students um, because it's very close to not only the school, but it's um, really close to banks and shopping and grocery stores, um, dentists, and um, what else? There was something else that I was gonna mention that was close to there. Um, uh, there are some uh, fitness facilities there as well. Um, so again, it's very popular. It's actually within walking distance of the school even. So um, a lot of students uh, do like to live there. Um, and as Katie will mention um, in her later presentation, there are some uh, downsides to that as well, um, which, which is because there's a lot of competition for those areas. But Katie will get more into that later. Um, for Thunder Bay, 
Uh, oh, sorry. Go back. I missed uh, the Lackley stuff. I apologize. It's Friday. <laughs> this, we're sunny here, so it's got me all kind of hyper and excited. Um, so there are some um, areas that you do want to avoid, and that's living along the Lackley route and south route. Um, that's obviously a possible. Um, they're not bad neighborhoods. It's just that they're not a direct link to the university and you would need to transfer uh, to at least one bus um, just to get to and from the school. So that's just something to consider. And they're not exactly close to a lot of amenities. Um, there are also a couple of um, friendly neighborhoods in the Thunder Bay area. Um, and that um, our neighborhoods, those are neighborhoods along the number two Crosstown bus and the Academy Heights neighborhood. Um, you can take the number two bus or number nine to Intercity or Waterfront Terminal um, where you can get easy access to the rest of the city of Thunder Bay. Um, route maps are available on both the city of Aurelia and city of Thunder Bay websites. And it's a really good idea to visit both of those depending on, well, either one, depending on which campus you're attending, um, just to get a copy of the route maps so that you can refer back to them. And I'll link the, um, the links to both the Thunder Bay and Aurelia Transit websites um, in the chat when I'm done with uh, the section of the presentation. Um, speaking of routes and buses and transit, um, both campuses have access to the UPASS and the UPASS is the universal bus pass. Um, so students are charged a fee on their tuition or if they're not charged the fee, um, they can opt into the pass. And that is um, for quite a substantial savings where you can get a sticker on your student card and you can use the transit system um, as many times as you like for the entire year. Um, so that's September to August. And then of course, if you're starting in January or the summer, you can still opt in um, and for a lower rate and your pass will be um, available until the end of August and then it resets again. So um, that's something that uh, unfortunately with everything being online right now in Aurelia is suspended for this year, um, just because we don't have many students living in Aurelia. Um, but the Thunder Bay U Pass is still up and running and um, you can access your UPASS um, through the LUSU office by appointment. Um, so if you have any questions about uh, the UPASS or transit, you can also let me know. Awesome, okay. So now you have a better idea of the neighborhoods that you can be looking in if you're looking for off-campus housing. Um, we wanted to let you know that the number one recommendation we can give you for searching for availability for houses is through the Lakehead University off-campus housing website. Uh, so the link is posted here on this slide. And when you go to this page, it's gonna look like the screen on the, the right there. So you can put your specific details in and as to what you are looking for and use the different filters. Um, you will then pull up all the available listings that are posted by local landlords uh, on this site in the particular area. Um, so please know that Lakehead University does not uh, vet or review these particular houses. We don't go to the houses and, and review them. Um, we simply receive the postings from local landlords, make sure that the details are complete and there's enough information for students to um, assess and to reach out to the landlord for more info. Um, and then we provide the service for them by posting them on the website. Um, so it is still your responsibility to do your research. When you find a listing on this website, make sure that you're um, visiting the property if possible, that you're asking the questions to the landlord um, and that you're following the information and guidelines that um, our community legal services team spoke about earlier. Um, the other service that's available on this off-campus housing website is the roommate listing service. So if you click on the left-hand uh, menu there that says roommate listings, you will find um, other people who are looking for um, places to live. They might already have a house and are looking for more people to come join them or are wanting to look with other people to find a joint or shared house. Um, so as a Lakehead student, you are welcome to post on there as well. Um, so know that that's kind of an, an alternative way of searching for some housing. Whoops, sorry. My presentation is refreshing here. All right, I think we're 
on track now. Um, so if you're not looking at the Lakehead University off-campus housing website, there are a few other resources out there that you can use. If you're living in Thunder Bay specifically, there's a great website called Rent Panda. Um, this is highly recommended. They do a great job posting ads and vetting properties and providing um, additional support to students that are looking for housing. Um, so check them out. But other ideas, if you're looking for housing options, you could be asking around with your classmates. You could be seeking advice from peer mentors. If you're in the International Peer Mentor Program, peer mentors are upper year students who um, have been through these, these experiences before. So they have lots of good advice to share with you. Orientation leaders who you meet uh, in September and January through orientation programming, they're a great resource for you too. Um, you could also leverage the power of social media. So post on your Instagram or your Facebook page and let people know that you're looking. You don't know who's gonna pick up on that and uh, could also be looking as well. And last but not least, um, there is Kijiji, which is a marketplace for buying and selling all different kinds of things, but um, real estate and uh, rental properties is definitely one. And some students have been really successful with it. Um, with all this being said though, our number one recommendation is always the Lakehead University off-campus housing website. Um, these are just some other alternative suggestions for you. Okay, so now we've got some options. We know where you're looking. Um, we need to also talk about some money matters so that you can plan ahead and know your anticipated costs. So there are lots of different factors that can affect the cost of your off-campus living arrangements. Um, as Lee mentioned earlier, if you're living closer or choose to live closer to campus within walking distance, um, there can be lots of competition. And sometimes you will see the prices are a little bit higher because um, there is, there is greater demand and these, these properties usually come with um, lots more amenities. Um, I will also add that the house is closest to campus and Aurelia specifically, um, they, are, they are much newer than many other neighborhoods in the community. And so for a variety of reasons, uh, sometimes you will see that the proximity to campus will affect the, the cost of um, living there. Another factor is whether it's a shared house. So whether you are sharing things like the kitchen and bathrooms and living spaces, um, or whether it's an independently occupied house. So you are the only person living there. Obviously, if you're sharing the spaces and sharing the cost, it's going to be more affordable and cost less. If you are the only person there, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. Another point would be check, uh, checking to see what utilities are included. So utilities are things like hydro or electricity coming to the house. Um, the water service, internet, cable, um, and a variety of other services, um, you need to consider whether those items are included in the rent, the rental cost, or whether they are going to be on top of it. Um, so that's a really important question to ask a landlord and to look for in the postings that you're reading. Availability of laundry, so this isn't everywhere. Um, sometimes it will be a coin laundry system in your house so you'll need to pay extra, or if there's no laundry available, you'll really wanna make sure that the house that you're choosing is near a laundromat in your local community. And last but not least is parking. This is something that you might not need if you don't plan on driving while you're living um, and going to university. Um, but if you are, you definitely wanna ask the question and uh, this could also in impact the cost of the uh, rental price. Um, it might be seen as more of a luxury item, especially if parking, um, if there's not a lot of availability of parking in that particular community. Uh, Francis, I see that you posted in the chat box that you had a quick question. Did you want to unmute yourself? Yes, yes. Sure, Thank go you. ahead. Um, just previously, uh, you had talked about with the Lakehead off-campus services and that um, the Lakehead hadn't vetted the places or the houses, but you could organize for a viewing. Yep. Is, that, is that still possible? In the COVID times, um, or or it's or it's not really affected. Yep, that's a great question. So we always encourage you to view the property. Uh, people have been getting a little more creative uh, during these times. And if you're not living in the local area, if you're living abroad or throughout Ontario. Uh, so some people have done this through Zoom or FaceTime meetings, getting a, a virtual tour of the property. Um, 
And if you're considering meeting in person, I strongly advise you to uh, check the guidelines of your local public health unit. So in, uh, if you're in Thunder Bay, it's the Thunder Bay District Health Unit. If you're in Aurelia, it's the Cinco Muskoka District Health Unit. Um, and really check to see what the guidelines are on um, being in social situations, um, physical distancing, masking, uh, sanitizing, yeah. and all those types of um, uh, precautions, of course. So, um, great. Yeah, good question. Thank That's you great. for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Uh, so a couple of the housing options you're going to see out there. One is a shared house. This is very, very common. So you would have a private bedroom. You would then share the kitchen, bathrooms, and living spaces. So often that means that you're sharing maybe kitchen equipment and cookware. You're sharing um, cleaning responsibilities. You're sharing furniture. Uh, so something to consider if this is the right fit for you. Um, oftentimes in this type of living situation, the rent will be inclusive. So um, that means that things like utilities, the hydro, the water, sometimes internet, um, those, those expenses are included within the cost of your rent um, and your landlord is going to, going to be paying those bills. Not always, but often this is the case. Um, you will often find that your range of price will be between $500 and $600. Um, and usually it's uh, up to four people. In the city of Aurelia, the local bylaw is, it's no more than four people um, if you're living in a shared house. So that's one option. The other option you'll come across is independent apartments or houses. So this is where everything is private, just you. Um, so bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, living spaces are all just yourself having access to. Um, oftentimes you'll see that this is non-inclusive rent. So you have your rental price uh, for your living accommodations. And then on top of that, usually um, those other utilities will be um, for you to take care of in terms of paying bills and, and setting up those services. Um, so ups and downs to both different housing options. I did want to include the fact that, uh, yes, we're talking about off-campus housing today, um, but don't forget that uh, on-campus housing in Lincoln University residences is still available to you even after first year. Uh, so although it's not as common for second, third, and fourth year students to live um, in residence, um, it, is a still, it is still an option available to you. Uh, so we wanted to give you a sample of what your expenses might look like and, and what the services uh, available are. Um, so we're comparing eight months versus 12 months here. So keep that in mind. Um, keep in mind that there are, you know, different perks to living on campus. You have security services available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, a lot of your social activities are planned for you by um, staff that live on campus. And there's also some great administrative support there. Um, so when you're doing your shopping, just consider what your needs are individually and what's gonna suit you best and help you to be most successful as a student. Okay, and I'll turn it back to Lee to talk a little bit about some uh, navigating roommate conflicts and strategies. Thanks, Katie. Um, so when you're living with people, whether it be family or friends or even strangers, it's inevitable that um, you're going to encounter some conflicts. It's just a part of living um, with other people. Um, but this doesn't mean that they can't be resolved um, easily and even in some cases avoided. So common roommate conflicts uh, can be related to personal space, overnight guests, noise, sharing of personal items and chores. Uh, most conflicts can be diffused or even avoided by communication. So you're going to hear me in this little bit talk a lot about communication um, because it is extremely important. So a good idea is to discuss your expectations and your rules or preferences beforehand. Um, communicate them as soon as possible. Um, if they do come up, don't let problems build up until you reach your breaking point. It's important that you talk it out as soon as things come up. So don't let um, things just kind of build up inside of you and then you kind of, you know, yell at someone for moving the salt or something. <laughs> You're gonna want to make sure that as soon as they come up, you, you discuss them. Um, on that note, you're gonna also wanna think about picking your fights. So don't, um, don't be nitpicky too much. Um, living together is about compromising and deciding what things are important to bring up. So um, save, the, 
save the discussions for the important things. Um, another good idea is to make friends outside of your roommate circle so that you have other people to vent to and to just visit. Um, but I will caution you about um, gossiping about your roommates because that will definitely cause more trouble in the future. So earlier we talked about communication and discussing rules and expectations beforehand. So setting expectations beforehand is extremely important so that everyone understands what's expected of them and some things that you'll wanna make sure are answered um, before, you know, maybe it's you have a new person coming into the house or you're a group that is um, starting a lease together. <clears throat> some things that you wanna consider are the following questions. Um, how will you handle payment of rent and other joint expenses? What will be your policy on using each other's possessions? What will your guest and party policy be? How will you handle cleaning responsibilities? I think that's a big one. You might wanna have a schedule made up so that everyone knows what they're supposed to do on that day. Um, will you grocery shop and prepare meals together or do that separately? How will you handle the mail? Who will bring what furniture and appliances? Uh, sometimes they are already included in the rental property, but sometimes they're not. So you're gonna to wanna to check with your landlord about that. And speaking of landlords, who will be responsible for calling the landlord when there is an issue? So these are just some things that you wanna consider um, beforehand, just so that you kind of all know what's expected of each other and who's, re ugh, who's responsible for what. Easy. Okay. So you've given, you've been given a lot of information. Now we want to give you a little bit of a timeline so you know when you can get started and take some action on all of this info. Uh, so through January and February, it's a good time to be doing lots of research to make use of the resources that we've provided today. Um, get to know the areas, your community, the different options available to you. Talk with all those contacts in your networks um, to really consider your, your um, options. February is a great time to start really taking action. And what we mean by that is to contact landlords, to be um, negotiating with friends, thinking about who you want to live with and starting to, to make those decisions and, and uh, put some pieces together. As we move into March next week, um, this is the time, and I know it sounds really early, um, but as, as upper year students can attest to, um, even if you're looking for something for spring or summer semester or even next fall, so September 2021, um, March and April are the, the months where students really lock those things in. Uh, so there's lots going on right now. You might not be aware, but students are doing their searching, they're doing their research, and um, they are starting to sign leases. So it's a good time for you to be doing this. Um, some things you want to think of are um, clarifying what your date of possession are, uh, making sure that that's going to be working with your timeline, especially if you're traveling um, and it involves moving a lot of furniture and things like that. And then throughout April, you really want to be wrapping up this process as you're wrapping up your winter semester. Um, so ensuring you've checked all those boxes that you learned about today, so that you've signed the proper lease, that you know all the expectations and obligations, um, and that you, you have everything set in stone for moving into your new um, exciting property come the new semester. Um, so hopefully in this way, you can leave after the winter semester and feel pretty good about your living situation going forward. So wanted to put up some housing supports and resources. We've talked about a lot of these things today, but wanted to put them in one concise place for you. Um, so don't forget about all these resources. They're there for you to access, uh, whether they're the on-campus services we've talked about, um, the, the housing websites, the community legal services team, um, or they're the, the local community resources. Um, like the health units and uh, landlord tenant board that we've mentioned today. Uh, so please don't forget about these things. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm going to cut it off there and open the floor to questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or you can use the chat box as well. Um, uh, can I go again? Sure, go ahead, Francis. Yes. So. Um, last year, I lived with about four or five people, and it was all right. Uh, 
I, I definitely related to some of the roommate conflicts, but it was 90% all right. I was looking at maybe getting a one man. Would you say there's more success in finding one man, especially at this time, February, March? That's a good question. Um, it, honestly, it's really hard to say. I don't know about Thunder Bay as well as I know Aurelia, but um, it's it's a little tricky right now. Um, if you're looking for more traditional like student housing in the student neighborhoods, usually those leases are gonna be signed for the academic school year. Um, so until the end of April, um, and then you'll find that gap between, um, between May and August. Um, that being said, um, most yeah. students are looking for shared housing because it's more affordable and cost effective. Um, so you might have a little bit more bandwidth looking for um, independent housing, um, which mature students would be uh, more keen to look for or non-students altogether. Um, so you'd probably be more likely to find independent housing versus um, shared housing right now in, in March and April. Okay. In March, oh, yes, no, so I would want it for starting in May. Oh, okay. so I'm I'm current so I'm currently back on the campus at Barclay. Okay. And then finishing up at the end of April. So okay. I'll be looking for May. Yep, good time to definitely be looking for that. Like you said, most of the leases for student areas are going to be ending um, in April, and student there's more mobility of students at that time, obviously. So. Yeah, definitely encourage you okay. to get looking as soon as possible. And be specific when you're sure. reaching out to people, let them know what you're looking for and what your expectations are. Okay, thank you. Um, question in the chat box for shared housing, what's the limit for the number of roommates you can get? So I don't know what the bylaw is in Thunder Bay, but in Aurelia, um, the bylaw is that you can't have more than four people in shared housing. I can't speak to Thunder Bay though. I believe it's the same in Thunder Bay. This is this is Dawn speaking, just because it's come up at our condominium. But it's important to know if it's a part of a uh, condominium, what their rules are. So in ours, you can only have three uh, people uh, in a house. There you go. So it'll it'll depend on the neighborhood and um, and whether it's part of a condominium or not. But yeah, we had I think somebody from the city, the fire marshal or somebody, actually come to one of our meetings and uh, sorry, board meetings for the condominium. And he had said it, that four was typically the, uh, the legal number. Awesome. Thanks, Don. And obviously, when in doubt, uh, we've said it many times now that we have community legal services and clinics in, in both of our communities. So definitely, when in doubt, um, reach out to the experts for sure. Um, don't see uh, um, any more questions or comments in the chat box there. Um, and knowing we're right right before our end time, um, I want to take a moment to thank our um, community legal services group um, for coming out today. I really, really appreciate it. Great session, great questions. Thank you for our participants for joining in and being engaged. Hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, please, please watch your email. We have our one last session on Monday, March 1st. And then after that, we'll be following up with all participants from all three workshops to uh, provide that link for our recording. So watch your emails. Um, in the meantime, you have lots of contact information now. So reach out if you have more questions. Thank you everybody for coming today. Have a great weekend.